Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the British Chamber's uh, latest webinar, uh, and our first since we come out of stage five lockdown and we're heading into stage four. But what does that mean? Does it actually feel any different to stage five? Uh, I can feel a building tide of opinion where people are being more openly critical to the government stance, to the legislation imposed. And as such, I've got a very distinguished panel with us today where we're going to explore what this shift and transition to stage four actually means and looks like. Is it enough? And what more should we be doing in terms of getting us back to full economic activity? Really pleased to welcome back Rianne Geldenhays from Trade Law Chambers, longtime partner and support of the chamber. And he's going to be giving his strategic overview of where we are from a legal perspective, but equally the implications of that from business. Tim Harris, CEO of Wesgrow, great to have you with us today. Uh, you've been a big supporter of the DIT and, and really pushing the agenda for the Western Cape. I'm really looking to hear how, how you see through the Western Cape lens, what do we need to be doing to advise government to ensure that we don't really further deepen this crisis? And John Cairns, a senior economist and head of research from RMB, RMB very much looking forward to your macro perspectives. And obviously got my colleague Cecilia, who will be feeding in your questions to the panel as we go through. And Ema in Mission Control will be managing the polls. And I really want to encourage interactivity today. I think I can feel this sense of rising frustration in the business community. I'm feeling it myself. And we want to use our sessions really as, as, as an opportunity to be the voice of business, to be robustly but respectfully critical to ensure we don't further deepen this crisis and indeed come out of it as quickly as possible. And what I will do, I'm going to start by asking the panelists to essentially give an open, an open plenary in terms of what are you seeing now in terms of this transition to, to, to level four? What does it mean? Are we doing enough? What are your key observations? And Rian, if I could go to you first, that'd be great. Morning, everyone. Thank you, Leon. Um, yeah, and I think thus far, what we've seen in terms of the transition has been a very fragmented transition. Um, we should remember that, you know, when we planned the move from level five to level four, we were given an opportunity to comment, uh, which was a very limited time period in terms of which to comment. And then all of a sudden, you know, we saw the regulations come out, so giving us a couple of hours as the business community in order to adjust to that. Um, however, we didn't have all of the ingredients or the recipe yet in order to be able to, you know, do this. So we're still waiting for a whole bunch of regulations and guidance coming out. So what we've seen now is, you know, we've even seen as recently as uh, two days ago, some of the regulations still coming out. And then some of the areas that we are opening up, we're still waiting for guidance. So most definitely going into level four has been fragmented and, and, and even staggered as that. And, and, and most businesses, I think, out there are still coming to grips with, you know, how is it that I can do this? There's a great amount of uncertainty that still remains uh, to this date. And that is kind of strange because the whole rationale between, uh, behind this risk adjustment strategy that government is, is, um, has imposed uh, and, and proposed is to seamlessly, so it seems, move between the different levels as we adjust to the need that the pandemic provides. And in that, we should, I think, already have seen at least some indications as to, you know, further period to provide us comments with level two, level three, level one, et cetera, so that the business community out there can start planning. It's very difficult in such uncertain times to know exactly what you want to do. I mean, I think there are a number of businesses out there that even though they are allowed to be open during level four, have simply taken the decision that we're not going to open because, you know, everything is not clear and everything is not thought through. We, we're seeing issues with interdependencies, certain sectors of the economy opening up without being able to rely on other critical sectors that you need in order to do whatever it is that you need to do. So that, 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 that appears to be uh, you know, a little bit of a constraint at this time and, and moving us towards this you know, seamless integration and moving between the different levels that the risk adjustment strategy gives us. And uh, you know, that's also maybe some sort of indication. You know, what are we reading to this? Is it that you know, we're going to have some period of time in terms of which we then all of a sudden see level three regulations coming out and businesses again given a couple of hours to adjust to it? Or, or does this mean that you know, actually what's happening is we, we need to take a longer time period to stay in level four? Um, I mean, government has been clear throughout. They want to move to level three as quickly as possible. But there's a big caveat. 
And the caveat is this. We can only do that if we don't see an increase in infections. So if we're looking at the provincial statistics that comes out on a daily basis, doesn't look good, especially for some of the provinces. And um, maybe Tim can speak to you what's happening within the Western Cape. Um, but, but this is something that we need to keep in mind. So it, it might be that we're in for a prolonged period of you know, uncertainty during level four and staying within level four. Thanks, Rian. I mean, that's a great opportunity to move across to Tim. But what I will do is really come back to those interdependencies and indeed how we can uh, feed back to government through our channel here and through BUSA. But Tim, just moving on from Rian's uh, opening points there, and particularly with the lens from the Western Cape, what, what are you seeing? And, uh, I think it's, it's important to recognize, firstly, what, what we've really got right as a country uh, in responding to this crisis, right? So it's a global crisis, unprecedented times. Every economy, every government has been feeling their way through responding uh, to the initially just the health threat and then working out how to manage the economic impact of that response. Um, and I don't think it's a, it's a coincidence that there was pr praise from around the world for the initial stages of South Africa's response. Particularly, you know, it was quite extraordinary in the beginning when um, our health minister, uh, Minister Mkhize, was putting out detailed statements every day on, on, on exactly what was happening uh, in terms of the spread of the disease. That was, he was frankly, he was over communicating, but that was exactly what was required. And it set the tone for um, this real leadership displayed by uh, Silver Ramaphosa, our president. Um, and I think we got a lot of credit from around the world for the initial stages of the response and particularly how quickly we were able to drive containment uh, of the virus. Uh, of course, the, the kind of shines come off that a little as the economic impact that Rian spoke about is becoming clearer. Um, and it does, you know, there are some really frustrating elements of the lockdown, even in level four, and particularly how we moved from level five to level four, um, where it, it just seems that there are, are, are decisions that are clearly not really grounded in the, in the health uh, implications, such as the, the, the cigarette ban. And you could is, even argue, particularly when you're sitting in the Western Cape, which is the, the heart of our wine and liquor industry in South Africa. Mm. I think there is a case for uh, um, handling the uh, consumption of alcohol dramatically uh, different, uh, differently. Basically, the, the, the theme running through all of these things, Leon, is there's a way to open up our economy safely, uh, not contribute to spreading the disease, but ease up on the lockdown dramatically sector by sector. Um, remember that the only point of the lockdown was to buy time for the health sector to respond. Um, and certainly the briefings we've been getting from the health sector are very encouraging. The, the, they've been able to add the emergency beds that are required for the projected peak. They're tracking that peak very accurately. Uh, and certainly I think what Rian was referring to in the Western Cape is the, the, the testing is being done in a different way here, much more targeted. Um, and therefore picking up more cases, um, but potentially helping us to manage the disease better rather than the allegation that somehow the Western Cape is an epicenter. I, I think probably the, 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 uh, there's much less accuracy to that uh, allegation than simply a, a realization that the, the, the methodology for testing is different in the Cape uh, and we, we, we're handling it differently. And I think it's, it's making uh, the Western Cape um, very well prepared to project the peak and to prepare for that peak. Uh, and that was the reason why we did the lockdown. Uh, now it's time, I think, to ask some difficult questions and get answers quickly on how much more we can ease the lockdown safely. Yeah, th thank you, Tim. And I think you make a couple of really critical points. And, you know, we must, we must uh, give credit where credit is due. And I think uh, the president was initially incredibly statesmanlike and assertive in, in implementing the lockdown. And I think we all believed it was done for the right reasons. And Minister McKeezy was very credible in terms of over communicating, which is essential. But much like the British government, you know, there was a great deal of sympathy for the British approach for Boris Johnson, particularly when he was battling COVID. But now we see real push and some of the decisions, the lack of preparedness, the apparent incoherence around some of the uh, the, the loosening of, of the uh, of, of the next phases. And 
sadly, the UK is the, has the highest amount of fatalities outside uh, the USA right now. So perhaps we can come back to some of those points. Uh, uh, particularly with the Western Cape lens, we can export wine, but we can't consume it ourselves. So somehow South Africans are less able to, uh, to navigate that, but our neighbors can. And particularly chatting to Kim Reed from Take A Lot, who understandably has been incredibly frustrated. You know, Amazon are making $10,000 a minute. Yeah, uh, Take A Lot could be doing the, probably not as much, but really driving economic activity and getting essential goods to us. I mean, I've got a 13 year old son and none of his clothes really fit him anymore. It's mm -hmm. really, in five weeks, they grow a lot. But before we come back and explore those, John, I'd really like to get your macro view, you know, from your, your position, you know, as an economist, as head of research at RMB, what are the macroeconomic trends you're saying, seeing? And perhaps finesse those down into a South African and Western Cape perspective as well. Uh, yeah, thanks, Dion. Okay, I can start with those macro views. So our, our views at RMB are for GDP to contract around 6.5% this year, uh, bounce back next year, but the, the size of the economy only be back to where it was. Um, by 2023, it will be back to where it was in 2019. So a real substantial hit. The risk to that number is certainly to the downside. Uh, I'm sure you guys have been seeing the media releases, various different forecasts. Um, if I may, I'll touch on those in a moment because a lot of those numbers you're seeing are actually coming out of first round itself. But just some other headline macro figures, budget deficit 12% plus, uh, maybe even up to 20, up to 18% of GDP. Um, so we are rapidly heading for government debt to GDP ratios in excess of 80%. And within three or four years, it's conceivable we can almost be at 100%. We've got very little inflation in the system at the moment. So our forecast is 3.3% inflation this year, with inflation dropping sub 3% in some months. So there is some scope for further interest rate cuts. We're expecting the Saab, Saab to cut another 50 and um, Leon, if I may, I'm also going to, if, you, if you're happy with that, I'd like to make some comments just in how First Rand is doing some modeling on the virus cases and how that is fed through into Business for South Africa and the Bank Association and then the advice we're giving the government. Yeah, you fine please if I do, go ahead with that? Please go ahead, okay. John. Thank you. So, yeah. uh, thank you. So obviously, RMB is part of the First Rand group. Uh, we, like probably many businesses, have our own COVID committee. But what, what one of the things we've been particularly active in is trying to help the government, through Business for South Africa, model the effects of the number of cases and in turn the impact that it's going to have on, on the economy. Um, the, 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 the bottom line from that is, you know, all, all these these epidemiology models are, are very tough. It's really dependent on a lot of assumptions that you put in. But the general view that comes out of our model and general models is that we can and probably will have the surge of cases that may last, may peak only somewhere between July and, and August before coming off. So when we extra, extrapolate from the, the model's results in terms of cases and the actual hospital availability of beds and so on, we can extract what is the optimal level of stage, of lockdown stage that the country should be in. Now what that pops out is, is very worrying. So that, the, those type of models are suggesting that areas such as Gauteng, uh, Western Cape Tim may have to be at least in stage two, even higher stage three up until September. Okay, but our view is that this is simply not feasible. Okay, the, the economy simply can't sustain, sustain that type of damage. So first RAND, through the Banking Association and then through Business for South Africa, is suggesting, you would have seen the press reports, but essentially that a lot of those views are coming out of the first RAND group saying, guys, okay, this may be the optical medical uh, position to take, but it's simply not feasible. Okay, so Leon, as you were saying, first round is, is part of that pushback. Um, in this case, we want to work very actively with the government. 
And maybe just to mention, we are also at the forefront of building that app that can track virus infections and where you've been and where you've been in contact. But the bottom line is, uh, the, while the epidemiology model suggests we should be in a lockdown for an extended period of time, our advice to government is we simply can't afford that. Thanks, John. I think I've got a question for you there. And once I pose that, perhaps we'll run the first poll, Ema, and then I can see we've got quite a few questions coming in already, Cecilia. But yeah. John, are you sensing that when you're pushing back to government, they are listening? Uh, uh, Leona, I'll be honest, I'm, I'm a few stages away from that. So I, 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 I can't on, answer honestly, yeah. Sure. I mean, I, I obviously have been with Martin Kingston and the Business for South Africa and, and uh, Cascavadi at Busa. And really, we want to be that voice and that channel to, to push back. And that's why, again, we're really keen to get your questions today so we can feed those into. We've got a breakfast briefing with Minister Patel tomorrow morning, but I think it's really important. But as we're doing that, please look at the first poll. Uh, your business under level four, how has the change from level five to level four restrictions affected your business's level of activity? And as you are responding to those questions there quickly, perhaps Cecilia can feed in a couple of the questions, observations that are coming up from the audience. Yeah, I think, um, I think one, uh, John has actually just answered from RMB's perspective, uh, particularly Nicholas Hall was asking, um, when is our expected peak? Because there are some differing opinions. Um, some people have said July, more recently than it's been September. Um, but from what I've heard from John, RMB thinks it's more around August, which is right in the middle of the two. Um, Nicholas also had a question, um, what RMB's and his view would be on when lockdown will actually be completely lifted. And we do know that, that this is really a stab in the dark for everyone at this stage. Um, Sandile Phillips has also asked the panelists' view on whether the prolonged lockdown stands to produce more deaths than COVID. I think this is a question we've seen in the media a lot. Um, and again, I think that the problem here is there's so many opinions. We've seen so many open letters going out all over. But what do our panelists think about that? What are their opinions on it? Um, I think we can we can give our panelists both Tim Harris and um, and Rian maybe a chance to answer that. Leon, you might have an opinion on it too. Yes. Um, I think this is a question that many people are asking. Cool. Thanks, thanks, Cecilia. And uh, uh, Ema, if you could run the results of our poll, and uh, I think we can introduce our new panelist as he comes live. I will introduce. So one of the key questions that I've had uh, and. There's a, there's a growing, so let's just review those. So no change compared to level five, 42%. Slight increase, 42%. Yeah, we can see there that there's not been a significant, um, so the, the you know 84% of us have had a slight to no change for the transition from level five to level four, which really, you know, we if we explore why we moved to level four was to get the economy moving again, because as one of the questions just said, are these are the lockdown uh, implications both economically and from a health perspective going to be greater than the cost of COVID? We've seen lots of data again, and there, there are stats and uh, lies, damn lies and statistics, but lots of data suggesting that there might be an even greater cost to for an extended lockdown, particularly in countries with economies and populations like ours. I don't know, Tim, before, before I introduce Nigel, do you have any comments or observations on some of those questions? Yeah, I think the, the question is, uh, and it comes to your point about responsiveness of government. Uh, you know, we put in, as the Western Cape, uh, it must have been about 60 proposals around the uh, stage or level four regulations. Uh, like many of the 70,000 uh, different parts of South Africa that put in uh, comments, we spent most of the weekend working on them. And, and I think roughly half were accepted of the ones that we put in. Uh, presumably there was strong overlap with lots of the others. Um, so there is a degree of responsiveness, but I think now given what's unfolded in the last week and given the analysis that's being done, um, somebody who was at uh, Sandile made the point about the uh, actuaries um, mm -hmm. analysis yesterday, the panda analysis, I believe it's called. I, I think there's now a, a, enough evidence to say we, th there's probably a chance to, to rethink the lockdown. 
um, you know, National Treasury put in a, a submission that said the lockdown should work the other way. Um, you, the, the, we should be prescribing who is not allowed to operate rather than prescribing who is allowed to operate. And I, and I think, Leon, if you want, if you want a single one sort of magic wand to wave to, to get things on the right track, that's probably it. Um, they are clearly uh, business activities that present a, a high risk and those, it just makes sense in order to keep buying the health department's time to, to have those constrained in some way. But let's make that uh, the element that we're specifying uh, and let's uh, open up the rest of the economy, much of which is still locked down, but could operate safely uh, with, with proper physical distancing requirements in place. Yes, thank you for that, Tim. And I think it's, it's encouraging to hear that half your recommendations were listened to. And I believe, you know, in this forum and as a chamber and as part of Booster, we really should be going back, you know, with, with a solutions oriented mindset, challenging but providing those solutions. And that seems like an incredibly sensible solution to, to get us moving again. Rian, we lost you for a bit there. We were just really looking at uh, are the costs of lockdown going to be greater uh, than the actual benefits of, of keeping us locked up. What is your sense in terms of what we need to be doing to, to releasing the, the, the economy? We saw from our poll there that 84% of us have really not seen any difference going from level five to level four. What, what, what are your observations? We, we may have lost Rian for a bit there. John, John, perhaps you could pick that up and comment. Uh. Yeah, so, so I, I, I can tell you what we observe in our global markets business. Of course, we trade in currencies and interest rates. So, I mean, currency trading is a very good underlying uh, representation of what's happening in the economy, uh, imports, exports. So, yes, Leon, we've seen a marginal tick up in, in, in business activity from our clients, but, but it, it is very, very mild. Uh, just broadly, our expectations are that around 60% um, of the economy still remains shut. So, so uh, I broadly just agree with your point and, and the poll. There has not been a broad opening of the economy. It still remains very restrictive. And Tim, I also agree with your point. Is it would be much better to say, if you can meet these requirements, then you then then you can be open. So, so again, tipping it on its head, the bias should be the nudge should be you open unless unless otherwise. Uh, thank you. I think we have one workable solution already. I can see Diane Brew has got a question. Perhaps you could just jot that down, uh, Diana, and uh, we could feed that in. I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce uh, His Excellency Nigel Casey, our High Commissioner and the British Ambassador here who him and his team have been working extensively repatriating Brits uh, out, of, out of Cape Town and out of Joburg. If we can bring uh, Nigel off, off mute and, and potentially invite Nigel to give your observations of what we've seen really transitioning from level five to level four, Nigel, and perhaps then exploring what, what we're looking to do as a British government to ensure that we kind of maintain these trade links that we've been working so hard on uh, for the last 12 years, particularly in the post-Brexit era. Thanks very much, Leon. Um, uh, let me just start by echoing a point that Tim made. Uh, I think it, um, uh, it universally acknowledged that the, the, the tough measures that the African government introduced early on in this crisis undoubtedly helped uh, to achieve a dramatic slowing down in the spread of the virus here, um, which have a few parallels in the world. Certainly, it's, uh, in comparison with the, the growth rates of the virus in Europe, it's very impressive. And that's rightly been praised. Um, it creates a problem of mess, if you like, in that it makes it um, uh, perhaps even more difficult to decide how to ease off the lockdown measures. And that, this is, a, this is, a, this is a, a similar conundrum to the one our, our own government faces. And you will have seen that our Prime Minister is due to review um, that today and make some uh, uh, further announcements on Sunday about how we're going to progressively ease our lockdown. Uh, and in terms of the impacts on what we've been doing here, basically our, our focus has been entirely on uh, responding to this crisis for the last six weeks. The, the, the single biggest chunk of that's obviously been uh, getting uh, stranded uh, British nationals, British residents back home 
and you've you've seen uh, what we've been doing on that front. Um, so we we had a initial wave of around two and a half thousand people who came to us uh, wanting to be repatriated in April. Uh, so we put on ten flights until we found the demand ran out uh, then most of those were were short-term uh, visitors in and around cape town uh, since the president's statement on the 23rd of april we've had uh, a new wave of people who've come to contact in, to contact us um and the common denominator for these people was that they they all thought that um regular commercial flights were likely to resume earlier and that, that is it's now much clearer from what the president and other ministers have said that it is uh, going to be months before international air travel is likely, certainly not before level two. Um, and, and that's obviously having a very immediate and serious impact on the airline industry. The, I mean, the good news is that uh, both of our major carrier services in this market, British Airways and Virgin, are both very committed to the South African market long term. They both put South Africa high up on the list of countries that they want to resume regular flights to as soon as they can. Uh, and so I, they, they see this as a, as a, a, a long-term part of their plans, even as they significantly um, restructure. You know, they, they both laid off significant numbers of staff, as you've seen, um, and uh, they won't be going to every destination that they had before, I'm sure. But South Africa is firmly in their plans. Uh, we have spoken to both of them. Uh, and other airlines about whether it is possible to operate even a limited service um, within the rules that the South African government currently has in place. Um, and I have to say that's extremely difficult. And for comparison, you may have seen that Qatar Airways tried and I'm afraid uh, failed to, to set up a regular series of flights this week. They, they had one flight which finally got out last night, but it's really hard to work with the restrictions that are in place um, on who can leave, um, who can come in, uh, and uh, what the bureaucratic requirements are to make that possible. Uh, we are, we're, yeah, we're looking at all options, but it's, it, it feels to me um, months away, um, uh, you know, we're months away from regular international flight happening again. Uh, at the other end of the telescope in the UK, we didn't introduce similar flight restrictions. Uh, some people have been surprised about that. Um, the main reason for that really was that by the time um, we introduced our lockdown, it was clear that we, the, the, the virus was well established in the UK. We had we had clear community transmission across the country, and the the, the value, frankly, of, of banning people from coming around the world, particularly um, uh, from countries where the transmission uh, rates were much lower, was limited. Uh, and also because we have been engaged in a global uh, effort to repatriate over a million Brits from around the world, uh, so of which South Africa is a is a part. So it's possible that there there will be some used to uh, encourage uh, people uh, arriving in the UK um, to self isolate uh, or what's called quarantine. I don't think it'll be quite the same as the South African um, uh, version of it, uh, but it, it, I don't think you'll find UK borders will be closed. Um, uh, and the other bit of uh, good news if, for companies is that cargo flights have not stopped. British Airways and Virgin, as you probably have seen, are operating regular cargo flights yeah, daily. Um, and that's all working. And, and that's, um, that's encouraging. Uh, it also keeps the airlines um, coming here, keeps their relationship warm, keeps the airports busy. Uh, and me it means that all the, the important support services are still there and can be kept going and don't fall away um, while passenger flights are stopped. So... That's been our big preoccupation. We're obviously spending quite a lot of time looking at what we can do to support the South African effort. We're repurposing um, uh, quite a lot of our program work here already, uh, and with extra um, uh, ODA support to South Africa, which we will be making uh, and when that's been decided on. Uh, the last part of what we're interested in, in doing uh, more of over the next recent months is really supporting all of you. Um, we do have lines like you do the very advisory groups that are, that are making decisions on what levels five, four, three, two, one mean. Uh, and uh, we've been able to help uh, in some cases, for example, helping to make sure that companies involved in um, call centers, work with call centers uh, involved in supporting 
the home working economy have been allowed to continue their work even supporting international uh, clients so that's been uh, positive and if you have examples where lockdown restrictions have um, have created specific problems which you think uh, we might be able to help uh, lend weight to the and other business bodies uh, lobbying on please just raise them with us and we are very happy uh, to use the channels that we have to to make the arguments to, to government there are people who are listening as Tim and others will know um, so please um, uh, I say if you if you've got issues let, let us know I through and colleagues so that we have a we have a funnel um, and can group sort of similar similar issues um, for efficiency uh, that's probably all I should say at the moment no, th thank you very much, Nigel. I kind of really appreciate that, that macro view. And, you know, the comparisons are very interesting when we compare global stats and how the UK operated versus how Sweden. And I think, you know, to, to, to be fair and even handed, you know, there isn't really a playbook for this. We've not, we've not encountered something like this arguably for 100 years. We could look at MERS and SARS. But some of the themes that came out of, of Nigel's uh, comments there, uh, the tourism industry and flights is perhaps something we can look at through a Western Cape lens. But really, Rian, uh, while well, we have the high, high commissioner as well, your concerns from an international trade perspective, you know, your firm is an international firm. It's your bread and butter. We talked about last week, we talked about stock freight getting stuck in ports. How are you seeing the mobility of goods, goods uh, uh, from an air freight perspective? You've touched on the interdependencies as well. And are we seeing those interdependencies kind of translate into the movement and mobility of goods? Thanks for that, Leon, and apologies to everyone, but uh, for those who of you who have been in South Africa for a while, at a stage there, when, when, when I was looking at my screen, it felt like I was watching a TV back in the day when all of a sudden we had gremlins come on. No, I have no idea where I went, but uh, I was no longer there. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's very interesting, Leon, and, and also just to touch base on, you know, what the higher commissioner mentioned. You know, uh, air freight is still going, cargo is going. However, it's not so clear because in terms of the Level 4 regulations that was published on the 29th of April, they say that that is, in fact, an essential service. However, if you look at the regulations that need to inform those Level 4 regulations that was published by uh, Minister Mbula on the 4th of May, it specifically only mentions charter flights for, you know, essentially mining routes, and that's also just from a domestic perspective. So... I think we're getting back to the point that we made last week. Um, and, and that is, in terms of international trade, at the very least, uh, if not every other sector, there's a great amount of uncertainty. So how does people, um, uh, you know, wherever they may be, whether that's at the ports, whether, it's, uh, whether they have to do with air freight uh, and cargo shipments, you know, how do they interpret these regulations if there is uh, most definitely uncertainty and perhaps even contradictory terms in some of that? Um, you know, regulations that has been published. Uh, it's, it's of a major concern. I mean, another thing that has transpired since the 29th of April is there's been a slight change, whereas they now allow cargo um, to be at the ports. But what does it mean? Does it mean that we accept imported goods, even though they're not designated as being allowed to be imported currently? Or do we allow for those goods to go to the... the ports in order to be exported, even though they're not permitted exported goods. So a great amount of frustration and uncertainty, and, 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 and makes it very difficult um, in the export and importation business to plan for it. I mean, you typically sit with months worth of planning in order to you know, get your products to and from the market. So it's, 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 it's highly frustrating. And also just as a caution, I have to say the following, that Again, these regulations were kind of published in a lastminute.com. Um, so they're not going to be perfect. Um, there are going to be issues with them. And again, there, I think that, you know, government's aim should really be to use the new risk adjustment strategy and roll it out and have people comment sufficiently in time so that all of these issues can be ironed out. I mean, there's no point in saying that this is going to happen. And then, you know, a few days later, we see the regulations that need to be implemented within a number of hours, and, and then you can't influence it anymore. It's, 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 yeah. it's unfortunately uh, creating a couple of bottlenecks, uh, most definitely within the ports, and most definitely with some of the producers. Um, you know, I think you mentioned also at the outset, um, our, um, we're sitting with, for instance, uh, you know, the beer problem that SAB has, or ABM, uh, at this particular point, you know, they can't bottle it, and then they might have to destroy 
what they haven't bottled. And that, the similar issues are true, of course, for many other sectors within the economy. It might not be alcohol related, but they are producing, but they can't get the stuff out. Or yeah. they go to the ports and they have to pay demurrage for you know, 15 days or 20 days uh, at a huge cost. So they'd rather keep it at the warehouses if they have warehouse space. Uh, thanks, Rian. I think that's an opportune moment to kind of run our second poll, Ema, if you could tee that up. Uh, and I think something last week as we relaxed, in inverted commas, the regulations in a transition to level four, a lot of us weren't really sure how we were going to prepare our businesses to return to work and what the requirements were. So I just welcome the audience's view there. How much notice would you need to reopen your business operation for facilities while adhering to the current measures stipulated? And again, just encouraging people to kind of, while we have the High Commissioner here in our panel, in terms of any key questions and obstacles you're, you're coming across. And Tim, as, as we're waiting for those poll results to come in, just picking up on what Rian said on the High Commissioner, particularly around the, uh, the flights, and I'm really concerned from a tourism lens, particularly from a Western Cape perspective. Not only do I normally get to Cape Town twice a month, which I'm sorely missing, but I can imagine if I was a hotelier or a restaurant in the Western Cape, I'd be really worrying how long I could hold on for when we would get back to some normality. How is that impacting the regional economy there? And then perhaps we can come across to you, John, afterwards. Yeah, <clears throat> thanks a lot, uh, Leon. I think, firstly, it's important to, to emphasize again how, how uh, critical the, the UK-Western Cape relationship is. Um, you know, this is the, the country that buys more products from the Western Cape uh, than anywhere else uh, overseas, uh, with our number one export product, as you pointed out uh, earlier, being wine. Um, secondly, you have by far more um, or the largest number of visitors each year coming from the UK um, to the Cape. Uh, so when we talk about uh, exports being disrupted, when we talk about uh, tourism being disrupted, in fact, we've probably got the most to lose, the, the, the UK Western Cape uh, relations. Um, so it's, it is encouraging, uh, as Nigel said, that the, the airlines, uh, certainly the, the, the carrier that has long connected Cape Town nonstop to the UK British Airways. And then, you know, we've we worked with Virgin Atlantic to get them uh, to announce their return. Uh, and we checked in with them yesterday and we're actually still on track. Um, so it is very encouraging that those air links for the time being uh, look like we can get them, it looks like we can get them back and going as quickly as possible given the lockdown. And that is important, not just for uh, some of our air freight exports or for bringing tourists here, but also for investment. We've seen uh, UK companies investing in the Cape in, in recent years. Nigel mentioned the, the BPOs, so we've got, uh, we've got Capita, we've got Merchants, yes. uh, we've got some major um, UK BPO operators who are, are having a tough time now but I think stand to actually benefit from the sort of global trend to more remote work and more remote servicing. So we're excited about what can happen in the BPO sector through uh, investors like uh, Capita uh, to, to grow the 30,000 international seats that we have already in the Cape. Uh, and that's one of those rare opportunities that we see around uh, the crisis. The other one is another uh, UK investor, Proversity. They're uh, strong in e-learning alongside some of our sort of homegrown success stories like 2U. Uh, and that is a massive growth sector in this. So, so it's, I'm, I'm only telling the stories um, because it shows the importance of the historical links between the UK and the Western Cape, how investment that has happened up to the point of the crisis has actually put us in a position where British companies are helping the Western Cape realize some of the, the few opportunities that could arise from the transition that COVID is forcing all of us to go through. But of course, uh, those are the, the kind of bright lights here. The darkest place is in fact in tourism, as you point out. It, it is going to be the last to recover. Uh, and certainly relative to other markets as a country, we are putting in significantly less support measures uh, and financial support in particular to help uh, tourism businesses. So, as Nigel said, the, the quicker we can get safe international tourism back on track, the quicker we can boost our, our, our efforts that are focused primarily on domestic tourism. But we're, we're, we're working very hard to keep the Western Cape top of mind with British travelers and working towards that day uh, when we can invite British travelers back uh, to enjoy everything the Western Cape has to offer. 
Thanks, Tim. Nigel, maybe that's an opportunity to come in there. And I know to reinforce the message around our commitment as the UK to keep investing in South Africa and specifically the Western Cape. Yeah, absolutely. Now, we, we, this is very much uh, in our thinking. And I, I can say um, two things about that. Uh, it, to, to add to uh, what I've heard from the editors directly about their, the, the, the importance that they, they see um, for South Africa and their long term recovery plans. Um, first of all, I, I, I spoke to uh, most of the passengers that we were putting on buses to go to Cape Town Airport uh, in April, um, and without exception, every single per every single person that I encouraged to come back said, "Oh yes, we're definitely coming back." Uh, many of them, of course, have got homes here, um, uh, and but but a lot of them are, are regular visitors um, and have a. I would say a relatively high risk appetite in terms of um, international travel that won't necessarily have been um, uh, taken away by this um, crisis severe as it is. Uh, so that gives me some um, some hope. I think I'm also um, happy to commit now to doing everything we can to support the uh, big campaign that will be needed to persuade tourists to come back here. You know, one big asset that we have uh, in the coming year is obviously the British Lions Tour, which is, you know, that represents uh, on its own 40,000 um, quite high spending uh, uh, tourists coming to uh, Johannesburg uh, twice in Cape Town, as well as for a host of uh, warm up games. Um, you may have seen some speculation in the press about whether that tour might have its dates changed or uh, be dropped. Um, we will certainly be doing what we can to make sure that it sticks where it is, because I see it as an important uh, plank of the tourism uh, recovery that we hope to be able to support as soon as um, government judges that it is safe to do so. Thanks. Nigel, that Lions tour seems to be like a, a very important decision line and uh, an opportunity for us to get some revenge and make some good bets around the FAF Speedo wearing opportunities as well. Uh, <laughs> perhaps, uh, John, that was just specifically because you opened up our, our planning session with reminding me that South Africa won the World Cup. Mm. But uh, let's see what the British Lions can do to you. Uh, I know, let's look at some of the poll results there. How much notice would we need? So 40% of us are essentially good to go with no notice. That's good to see. A similar amount with less than a week and about a quarter of us with one to three's notice. Maybe that's kind of testament to the agility and mindset of us people in South Africa and as Brits that are over here that do have that kind of sense of risk and adventure is why we want to keep coming back. Uh, I know there's some questions from the audience, Asila. Can, can you maybe feed some of those into us now? Yeah, I think um, actually a few, a few statements also. I can see that um, I think uh, along with all of us, um, there's, there's just a lot of questioning of the regulations that we've seen so far. A lot of things that, that simply don't add up. Um, Gareth Druce makes a good point. He says, um, uh, allowing manufacturers under the 30% rule to produce something but not allowing retailers to sell that same product seems crazy. Either you've got to allow unfettered e-commerce or give retailers a similar 30% rule um, makes a very good point. Um, we've also had a comment from... Sandile on the interest rate. I think I'll save that one for r and specifically. Um, but also people saying, um, sorry, I've lost my, my space here. Um, it's also, it was noted by Minister Patel that it's unfair um, for unfettered e-commerce from the likes of Netflix, but this is unfair to DVD stores, he says. Um, so I think there's, there's a, a big sense of who's really being, um, you know, treated fairly and under these circumstances with COVID, there seems to be no real fair option somewhere, someone is getting screwed um, in a way. Um, and that seems to be a big bother for people, obviously. Um, yeah. Brian Andrews saying back to um, exports, they are actually not seeing a free flow of air freight at all. They're limited flights and availability, and they're struggling to get their goods in. Um, I think I'll get back to some delay. This is one for you, possibly, John, saying with the interest rate at its lowest and the South African brand at its weakest compared to major foreign currencies, is it perhaps time to fix the interest rates of long-term debt? 
and revisit hedging strategy for those that are importing. Thanks, Cecilia. Uh, yeah, thanks, and, thanks. And, and, and John, I'm conscious you've got about eight minutes, so a, a good opportunity to answer that question and then perhaps more broadly comment on some of the other themes uh, that have been raised. Okay, th thanks, Dion. So um, I'll, I'll answer the, the question more broadly. So where, where are the opportunities in financial markets for, for all the businesses on this call? So um, we, we're a little bit cautious on the interest rate hedging at the moment. Um, of course, we would love your business, so we don't want to turn you away. But um, just, just perhaps be cautious in terms of hedging interest rates because the curve is very steep. I won't get too technical, but there's been a lot of dislocations because of the foreign selling of the bonds and essentially swap rates are not really trading where they should be. So you could argue that it's expensive. I would certainly argue that it would be expensive. Uh, but please, please engage with us and we can go into that more, more detail. Where we do see a lot more scope for businesses to manage their risk in an opportunistic way at the moment is on diesel fuel hedging. As we all know, fuel prices have come down. So if you're a big fuel consumer, lock it in. We're happy to help there. The, 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 the RAND is is always in favor with importers, exporters. Please have a, have a chat chat. Um, but uh, Cecilia, you, you made a comment right at the beginning just about the modeling of the, when is the peak in the virus cases gonna be? And you mentioned our, our modeling is saying August. I, I, I'd, I'd like to make a more general comment please, and I suspect many people on the call will, will appreciate it. Um, quite honestly, we don't really know. Okay, no one knows really. Um, I've speak, spoken to these epidemiologists, the experts, and the, the lack of information that we have is extraordinary. Uh, not just in South Africa, and not just with us, but just our understanding of what's really driving this. Is, is winter here going to drive it higher? We don't know, et cetera, et cetera. Just so many unknowns. So when I say August, that's an, an assumption more than a, a, a forecast as such. Again, we just don't really know. And that, uh, it really influences how we need to deal with this opening of the economy. Perhaps we open the economy and virus cases go to 30 or 40,000 and it's not nearly as much as we feared. Or maybe it's much worse. And so what we expect is going to happen is it's not a progression necessarily from stage four to stage three to stage two downward. Uh, the worry for us is we might have to go up stages again. So maybe we get to stage three and virus cases are a lot worse, the hospitals aren't coping. And then that would be a very negative scenario for the economy that we have to move back. So, so really, I just wanted to reiterate that point is we just don't know, okay? The, the experts we're chatting to just don't know about it. And that really creates an added uncertainty in, in all those variables. Thanks. And uh, thank you very much for that, John. And I, and I appreciate you may need to slip off at some, some time. Uh, I just think going back to some of those co points that you raised, and particularly Cecilia's points around Minis Patel's perceived test of fairness, you know, from, a, from an e-commerce perspective, from selling hot food, uh, that is, I saw that's one of the most frustrating elements. And I think if I can kind of shift the conversation forward, and we've probably all read Gareth Cliff's letter, Pete Maton's very articulate letter, there's a group of doctors that wrote a very well-structured letter to the government, essentially challenging the whole health concept of, of the lockdown. And it, we can look at, you know, the CEO of Saatchi and Saatchi, Mil Sokko from Bits Business School, Solly Maweng and Magna at Signia, Signia Capital, really pushing back and challenging. And I think one of the key concerns that is developing is this narrative around mission creep and a, a potential Trojan horse to kind, of, to kind of take away some of our civil liberties and, you know, edge closely towards some type of temporary police state. And I welcome the panel's views on this in terms of, do we fear that coming out of this lockdown, there are, there are other motives? Yeah. And, I, and I open that up. Le Leon, Leon, I, yeah. Le Leon may, may, maybe I can just jump there as a final comment before I have to go. Sure. Rian can, can, can really add to this. But um, it will, maybe I pose a question to Rian is, uh, it's not only just the businesses and all those high profile people you've mentioned pushing back, but there seems to be increasing legal challenges to the whole lockdown. So yeah. maybe Rian can give us an, an assessment of that because yeah, I mean, a lot of these regulations don't seem constitutional and so on. 
So maybe even if the government wants to keep the lockdown, maybe the courts may force an opening, an opening of the economy. John, John, great segue. And thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Rian, from a thank legal perspective. Much. Thank you. Thank you, Leon, and thank you, John. Um, yeah, I, I mean, there has been some pushback. Um, and I think probably you're going to see increasing pushback. I don't think it's imminent. And the reason I don't think it's imminent is we've seen a couple of decisions already coming out of the courts where people have challenged some of the regulations and, uh, and they've fallen on their noses. Now, of course, there's a possibility that they may appeal and then be successful. I think another big indicator was uh, BAT South Africa withdrawing their, let's call it, stance or threat towards government um, and, and taking more conciliatory approach to say, listen, this is something that we need to address with government and let's work with them. And, and, I, and I think that is also key. I mean, government should realize that they can't do this alone. If they do this alone, they will be alone at the end of this. Um, we need business, civil society, etc., uh, uh, to help government and make informed decisions as to how we going forward. Um, and, and then again, that comes back to the point that I continuously make, you know, within this, we, we need to make sure that, you know, we have sight of what's happening before us. I mean, even at a high level, relatively high level, at the BUSA level or business for South Africa level, you know, there's, uh, there's deep concern in the sense that, you know, they haven't seen anything in terms of level three or onwards. They don't know what the plan is for level four. Um, this is concerning. Um, and, uh, and they are a key partner to government. I mean, many people have donated many resources. Um, Full-time employees seconded to Business for South Africa in order to and yeah. ensure that we've got the right kind of professional and other people involved in making sure that government is well informed as to what is really needed here uh, and how that approach may be in order to, you know, both safely and effectively open up the economy. Um, so it, it remains a concern. Um, so one can only hope that there will be good pushback and that the pushback will come with the right types of reasons because I think that will also be probably precedent setting as to what's going to happen. And then, of course, we, we have to, you know, keep government in check. I mean, at the outset, I think a statement was made about, you know, Mr. Patel's perceived, you know, fairness. That's not the test that government imposed. Government was pretty clear. They said that they'll open up whatever you want to open up, as long as there's a low risk of transmission, whether that may be that we take certain measures and to ensure there's a low risk of transmission. And then, of course, it, it has to be, a high impact on that particular business or sector, or it's got to be high value sector or business. So that's the test. It's not perceived fairness. It's not whether mm. a retailer are able, uh, will be able to uh, you know, use e-commerce to deliver to the suburbs. That's not the test. Um, um, so if, 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 if regulations are in place, I, I think that, uh, and government strategy is in place, then I think that Everybody within the cabinet needs to adhere to those. Thanks, Rian. And I know, Tim, you're very plugged in into government regionally, nationally. And I think we can see some, some elements of mission creep and kind of uh, lack of consistency around what the initial purposes for lockdown were. We see uh, Minister Zuma having an about turn in what some people have called a capricious change of direction. And we've seen Minister Imbawini speaking out very frankly and freely yesterday on his Twitter account around, uh, you know, the need for free market economics. What are you seeing in terms of mission creep and clarity around the purposes of this lockdown and indeed how we come out of it, Tim? Yeah, I, I think I mentioned the lobbying effort around level four um, and that was a very busy weekend last weekend. But, but since then, we've decided to step up the lobbying as the Western Cape on all of the, the outstanding uh, areas where it's, it just doesn't make sense to keep business locked down. I mean, one of them is simply the 30% limits on manufacturing. Uh, I think a lot of companies can't make that work and they could operate at a much higher rate of employment uh, safely. Um, there's also some anomalies like uh, nurseries where it's not clear they can operate renewable energy players. A lot of uh, sectors, uh, construction, for example, huge drivers of employment and um, output and able to operate safely very, very easily. So we've stepped up the lobbying under the leadership of, of David Mania, the economic MEC. 
But I, and I understand you've got Minister Patel tomorrow morning, so hopefully you can uh, convey some of the messages here to him uh, very clearly. Um, I just want to, if I may, Leon, focus on, you know, we, we, really, we really focused on, on how to change the regulatory environment, but there's a couple of things in place to help businesses that we've developed for the Cape, but are certainly available to any business uh, anywhere in the country, including uh, British business. Um, and that, there, there's just three things I want to cover. The, the one is uh, we've set up a, a, a sort of non-Westcrow website, uh, which is supportbusiness.co.za. And that's our kind of hub where we, we're working on behalf of the province and the city and our other agency partners to get on top of the the COVID issue as it evolves. And the first evolution is the stuff uh, rian has been talking about. How do you keep on top of what you're allowed to do and not allowed to do as the regulations evolve? So there's a whole team working on what we call FAQs, frequently asked questions, that we're updating by the hour sometimes so that companies can understand what they're now able to do. Secondly, we've got a tool on there called the Support Finder. The one thing the South African government is not able to do is provide the financial and fiscal support that the British government has been able to provide. So there's about 35 support prog financial support programs available across business and the private sector um, and the government space. And that support finder just helps companies work out which of those packages they're eligible for. It's, it's a five minute questionnaire. You fill in your details and it, it gives you the details of what you should be applying for. That's been a very, it's been really taken up by tens of thousands of companies across the country. And the last one, if I may, is what we launched yesterday, actually in partnership with RMB and FNB which is our PPE marketplace and a maskathon. So what we're doing is we, we're channeling corporate demand for masks in particular to large and small manufacturers in the CMT and clothing and textile space that are able to transition their manufacturing to start making masks. You know, masks are, are now legal requirements. Uh, so more and more companies are trying to source them and we see this as an opportunity to save some jobs in the clothing space. So I just encourage all of the chamber members uh, to get onto that platform and help uh, save some clothing and textile jobs. But also if they're, if they're in a space where they can pivot to manufacturing masks or other forms of PPE, please get on that platform uh, and help be part of the solution. Well, thank you, Tim. And uh, EMA Emission Control has just reminded me that we, we've certainly been sharing that through our digital channels, channels and social, social, social platforms. But perhaps, Nigel, uh, just, just maybe we can take this to a kind of more strategic level and the question around protection and civil liberties is, is, is a delicate one but perhaps looking at global best practice we, we, we were actually coming out of a world where we were moving towards perhaps a more nationalist agenda you know with, with certain political leaders and their agendas and Rian's referred to interdependency in business but how is it feeling from a global interdependency perspective are we mobilizing at a global level country to country, leader to leader, diplomat to diplomat, to look at how we can share best practice and really tackle this global pandemic? Yeah, look, I think uh, with a couple of high profile exceptions, the, uh, the international response has, has been uh, in, in practice a, uh, a, a very multilateral one. I don't know if you've seen it in, in the last couple of weeks, a couple of very high profile virtual summits, which have been held particularly um, to gear up support for vaccine development, uh, testing, and then mass rollout and distribution, um, which is, a, that's a, that in itself is a real step up from the last uh, big uh, pandemics, uh, because in the, in the case of uh, SARS and MERS, what you saw was that uh, when vaccines uh, were eventually produced, uh, the distribution was skewed towards richer countries first. And so there's a, there is a, a big multilateral effort on um, uh, which President Raposa has been uh, heavily involved in uh, in his capacity as current AU chair um, to make sure that uh, there is a, uh, a big uh, effort uh, properly funded, led by the relevant global institutions uh, to make sure that when a vaccine is available, uh, it is rolled out all over the world. I think everyone's realised that unless you eliminate the vaccine, the, 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 the virus um, everywhere, it's just going to keep coming back. Um, so uh, that's that, that, I find that encouraging. I, there's also there's been a similar multilateral effort on on debt through the G20. Again, South Africa is the Africa representative in the G20, so has been involved in encouraging that. The president has appointed uh, envoys, including Trevor Manuel, again um, to uh, act as advocates for debt relief for Africa. 
and that's coming through in, in you know what they what they're saying to us in in, in conversations um, between uh, ministers. So uh, yeah, I, I actually think that you know beneath the the very obvious um, uh, headlines, um, the, the the real picture is is well, it's a lot more multilateral than it seems, and that's encouraging. And I think. You know, when it, uh, it, it's it's uh, it's the most multilateral response to uh, an international pandemic um, that I've ever seen. Ebola was was big, um, but what was primarily a disease which affected West Africa. Um, this is a this is a, a global pandemic which is which is uh, really motivated and and and, and uh, created a, a multilateral uh, response. So I, I and I think South Africa again uh, is getting. A lot of recognition and, and credit for that um, uh, because of the president's uh, involvement and and uh, and style. So I think he's been pretty persuasive. Thanks. No, thanks, Nigel. That, that's really encouraging to hear. And and I've not, I've jotted down several silver linings that have come up that Tim's mentioned and and you've mentioned. And again, the, the British Lions tour is high on my agenda of if we can all be celebrating, drinking and uh, watching the British Lions defeat South Africa together next year, we can perhaps look back on this as a test that we all came through. I look forward to that. Before we start concluding and looking at perhaps what are the silver linings and what are the action points that we're gonna do as a chamber in conjunction with WESGRO, with trade law chambers and indeed the High Commission, perhaps let's explore the very thorny topical issue for all of us, which is working from home with our children, with our spouses, sharing that space and the, and the need for a return to school. And perhaps it's something you know, that we all have differing views on, but uh, perhaps we can share, the, share this kind of poll there. What are we thinking in terms of the, the return to school? This is something that comes up four or five times a day in my conversation. So I welcome your views on it. And perhaps before I share mine, perhaps we can, uh, again, to all our panelists, explore what our views are, what we're hearing, what we think. I, I will be critical of the communication that I've been receiving from ISASA, from their need to generate fees, even though the schools are closed, and their need to charge boarding fees despite the schools being closed, to the semi-coherent, incoherent briefings that we observed last week around the openings that led to much confusion. What are we thinking as a panel in terms of the way the communication has been handled, and indeed what we believe will be the right next steps in terms of opening the schools? And uh, Rian, I know you've been camping out under the stars many nights. Uh, <laughs> how are you finding it? And indeed, what are your thoughts around next steps? Thanks, Leon. Yes, um, I mean, we have to do what we have to do in order to keep the kids entertained. So yes, I've been sleeping outside on, under the stars quite often. Um, uh, and for my sins, I'm also chair of one of the governing bodies of one of the schools. So I'm acutely aware of my personal need for my kids to go back to school, but then also, <laughs> Um, in terms of, you know, other parents' concerns um, and also, of course, needs. And, and I agree with you, the, the communication thus far has been not the best. It could definitely improve. Um, and I also think, you know, guidance should be a bit more forthcoming. So we, we have some ideas, you know, uh, juxtaposed as to what the possible dates may be and, you know, looking at a phased-in approach. But we haven't really seen any, you know, meat and substance to what that's going to be. I mean, I'd like to, for instance, see things like, you know, if, if we are having a phase in the approach, perhaps it is that we need to look at what parents are doing. Where are they allowed to be currently in terms of being active within the economy? So surely if we are all stay at home parents, so to speak, because we have to work from home, then there's a very limited risk in my kid going to school if, of course, he goes to school with the remainder of, you know, all of the other kids in the class who also have similar circumstances. So, for instance, having a Monday where those kind of kids go to school and a Tuesday where, you know, you have a higher level of exposure with, you know, perhaps more onerous um, uh, requirements in terms of ensuring the safety of both the staff of the schools and, and the kids. But yes, absolutely. One thing is true as we need to have a plan in place in order to get people to go back to school. Uh, another concern is, of course, the fact that even though we have some regulation in terms of who's allowed to come back, to your house in order to maybe mind the children and help them with homeschooling. The reality is for quite a lot of workers who are, are able to go back to work, it's simply uh, an issue of affordability. Can yeah. I have someone come to my home in order to mind my children while I go and be economically active? So that remains an issue. Now, th thanks, Rian. And I'm, I'm gonna jump in here as a parent and I'll invite all of us to kind of comment. Uh, I know, Tim, you, you went to one of those schools down in the KZM Midlands. Uh, my children went to the other one, the better one, I should add. 
I, I joke, but I, I must commend, I must commend some of the creativity and uh, commitment from firstly Stellenbosch University where my son's in his first year. The communications are in first class, the way they've embraced online delivery. I don't think they probably work that hard when they're actually in res and they don't have the distractions of the nightlife of the Western Cape. So I must commend Vim de Villiers who's really been leading uh, fantastically and ensuring perhaps disadvantaged students have the right technical support to stay on track and I was part of a very good webinar with him and the chief exec of Renaf Nusfas yesterday. From uh, the prep school perspective down at Clifton Notties down in the Midlands you're probably aware of Tim uh, that the head there has just been very good in terms of embracing online assemblies phoning the kids on their birthdays to celebrate it with them and really having a, a first class online program including a sports program but i know that's not the same across all schools and i think particularly I mean, CC, you can perhaps comment as someone with young children how challenging it is you know kind of keep toddlers and babies entertained and perhaps children under 13 it's almost a full-time job while still trying to manage your career your career and, and run the house as well Yeah, I think from my side, two years can definitely comment on that. Um, and you get my my eldest son, just over three years old. Um, but I'm getting the questions about when am I going back to school again? Um, you know, we've got Zoom birthday parties, which the kids don't don't quite understand. Um, equally, I've got an eight month old baby. I'm I'm being conscious that she's falling behind on her immunization schedule because all immunizations are being um, held up at hospitals. So now you think when they do go back to daycare or to school, they're suddenly at risk from all the other communicable diseases that uh, we've had for the past 60 years and been immunizing against. But we've we've sacrificed that for the sake of COVID. Um, so there, there are loads of questions, um, but that's that's a whole different point. I think it is hugely challenging, particularly for those having to homeschool as well. I don't think it is sustainable um, at all. Something needs to happen. I feel the approach has almost been, I've been reminded of the childhood game, pin the tail on the donkey while you blindfold it. Um, and I think that's that's what some of these regulations from government kind of feel like to me. Um, and I get that no one really knows, as we've heard from different opinions um, today on the panel too, no one really knows, but at what point do we say statistically, what are the risks and where are we going to take the risks and just go for it because the situation can't continue as is. Um, and even the phased, and I think my problem is the phased in approach for me has not been really risk mitigating. I think it's still sticking to pretty much the level five risks um, in my experience. Um, so I, I feel there's a, a big fear for taking any kind of a risk, whereas it is not an option to go risk-free at any point. Thank, thanks, Cecilia. And you invite many military analogies, which I know EMA emission control is keen for me to avoid, but at what point do we break cover and start taking some bullets so we can advance? Tim, I'm not sure, do you have children yourself? Yeah, I've got a, a four-year-old turning five tomorrow, uh, which is going to be one of those Zoom birthdays <laughs> yeah. Cecilia was talking about, yeah. and an eight-year-old. So, yeah, I, yeah. I, I know exactly what everybody's talking about. I think the most sensible position on this I've seen was actually in The Economist last week. It was one of their leaders. They, they essentially made three points, one of which is, is I'm very partial to being a parent of very young kids. Uh, the first and most important one is that um, you know, it, there's a there's an inequality in the ability to work uh, yeah. remotely and to do schooling on Zoom. And my kids' school have got a whole program that's that they're able to run online. But I can tell you the biggest challenge for Westgrow as an agency moving to working from home was connectivity. We're still dealing with connectivity six weeks later, and this is for professionals who work at Westgrow trying to do their work remotely. I can tell you for for kids in lower income communities. The, the gap is widening between them and the affluent uh, kids as as the lockdown continues. That's the one point the economist makes. They also make the point, yeah. uh, as you're hearing from Cecilia, that uh, if you're homeschooling, you're not doing your work as a parent. So there's a huge knock-on impact on the workforce, which we, we're all experiencing, but particularly uh, people who are in a more vulnerable jobs uh, and perhaps lower income jobs, it's, it's, it's a really a much an outsized impact. And then the one that I, I'm definitely partial to is the idea that actually when we open up, the younger grades should go back first. 
the, the economist argument is that they, um, they're the least at risk, potentially. They have, they say, the thirstiest brains. And they also obviously demand the most of their parents. And I know that's actually the opposite of what's being considered. People talk about coming up from the, from the more senior grades. But I think there's a strong case for letting, letting the littlies back in um, first. Interestingly, you know, there hasn't been much coverage of this, but I, I think if we're going to lobby around this, the one group we probably should be lobbying is the teachers' unions. I, I, I understand there's a big resistance from that front, and I think we need to, as a group, convince the unions that this is something that really needs to be taken seriously in the public interest. Th thanks, Tim. Nigel, I'm aware you've got kids at school internationally in that critical phases of their e exam life. H how's that impacting from your side, if you don't mind me asking. Yeah, they uh, they were stuck in the UK at the beginning of the crisis there. They had both attend UK boarding schools and uh, my son in particular uh, could be one of the great um, uh, you know, the beneficiaries of this in the sense that he, he's had GCSE exams cancelled basically. Um, yeah. have, so having, having done quite well in his mock exams, he's hoping that he's gonna get that translated into good results. He's gonna have a nervous <laughs> wait till July in the meantime his his school uh, has produced an excellent um uh, well at least in my view uh online learning experience and they're, they're effectively advancing his a-level course by half a term and doing a bunch of other stuff uh, which has been quite interesting and so um both he and his sister are sort of fairly fully occupied online uh, in, in a virtual school day um from home which has been which has been great. I, again, I, I expect that um, the Prime Minister will announce uh, something about the return to school regime in the UK. Um, the, the other sort of priority group that other countries have looked at is the, uh, including South Africa, is the, is the group that's preparing for exams in the forthcoming academic year as the group that needs the, the school time the most. Um, and so, I, you know, there are various arguments. It would be a lot easier for policymakers, um, if it were clear from the science um, uh, what um, the risk of children passing on the virus to others really is, if, if it is true that that, that uh, children are very poor vectors of transmission, then that would obviously make it a lot easier um, to decide on a widespread uh, go back to school regime. But I, I do sympathise with uh, policymakers and school governors because um, people are very litigious uh, and yeah. everybody is rightly terrified of being sued for, for uh, decisions which they make in good faith which have horrendous consequences uh, down the track so I you know I can understand why people have been quite cautious but there is now a you know, growing body of international practice from other European countries from Australia and New Zealand on how to go about this um, and I, you know, I think um, uh, we, I say, we'll see some some announcements from the UK. I would expect on Sunday. Thanks, Nigel. I mean, interesting two two points from the different end of the spectrum emerge from that. My my sister teaches in the inner cities schools in the UK with uh, people from disadvantaged backgrounds, and what they have done in the UK is keep the schools open for key workers, so the children of nurses, police, soldiers can can carry on and do their jobs. But what's been one of the unintended consequences is the social impact of a lot of children in the UK, the only good meal they get a day is at school. So the kind of knock on uh, health implications of not being fed and perhaps being in dangerous environments like much of our children here at our school. So the cases of domestic and violence and child abuse have gone up by 21% in the UK. And one shudders to think what those stats are here in South Africa, uh, it, it perhaps in, in more challenging environments. The other thing, the flip side, is, as Nigel's commented on the school curriculum, is I think what COVID has shown us is, you know, we've, we've been able to adapt very quickly in some areas, areas and kind of challenge the existing paradigms. So the concept of working from home is now proven. It can be done. And indeed, our traditional structural methodologies of teaching, we can radically change them. So as much as going to school is giving parents a breather, but allowing our children to socially interact and grow, a lot of that online learning can be really advanced. You know, I've been enjoying deep diving into the history of the First World War with my 13 year old, perhaps at greater depth than he would have been able to do in a traditional classroom environment. So there are some silver linings there too. Ema, perhaps you could put up the poll results there just so we can see what we're thinking in terms of the return to school. Interesting. So 24% the minority believe they should remain closed. 
uh, the majority of us looking at a, a gradual return, about 60%. Uh, and then we can see a certain amount of people not sure. I actually think uh, that's quite a shift. Uh, in the UK, I saw some stats that 74% of the population were keen for the schools to remain shut and the lockdown to remain in place. And there were similar stats in South Africa last, last week as well. Well, as we kind of enter our final eight minutes, I'm kind of conscious that uh, uh, we're running out of time. Perhaps we could invite some final questions from the audience, Cecilia, before I invite our panelists to make some concluding comments. And perhaps in those concluding comments, we could start considering what, what one or two silver linings that we're seeing from this whole pandemic crisis, and equally, what one or two points of action we're going to take forward following this webinar. Cecilia. So just unmute there, Cecilia. Uh, sorry. Um, I think we've had more comments rather than questions so far. Um, I think everyone is along the lines of the thinking, questioning uh, the regulations as we see it. I think um, what we've seen from a few of the comments to you is, is, is the trust in government that's really eroding at this stage. Um, I think Rian also commented earlier on saying that, you know, we, we need to help government shape these policies. And from what I'm seeing, I think there's been a huge push um, from business to actually give input, but they've not really been allowed to do so always to the best of their abilities. And then when they have, has it been taken on board? I think there's definitely an erosion of trust there. Um, we've had some questions, particularly if we're sticking to the Western Cape agenda, um, asking around uh, clients from the tobacco and alcohol industry, is there some kind of a roadmap um, or something we can assist them with um, to make it a little bit easier for them to trade store, to even predict and, and try and get to grips with how should they plan for the next few months, how should they survive. And um, these industries are, of course, a huge employer in the Western Cape and huge contributors to tax and the government fiscus. Um, I'm aware that they have been given some tax breaks, but I think it just boils down again to the big uncertainty that we have around this whole aspect. No one knows how long it's going to be. No one really knows what to do and how to play it, but no one seems to also be willing to take the risk. Thank you. Thanks, Cecilia. Some good observations there. And I think, you know, we saw, we've seen BAT's legal contestation, a good, good, member of the chamber. We've also seen AB InBev asking the government to allow them to transport their beer so the fiscus doesn't lose 500 million rand from beer that we're going to technically pour down the drain. Uh, with all these challenges and the concerns and the kind of apparent degradation of trust that people are experiencing and sharing in the government, I am sensing some real kind of positive steps we can take as, in, as an organization in terms of really robust at communicating some key messages, very much that we want to work with government to support them in making the right decisions and understanding that it is immensely difficult time to be a leader. And, you know, we can look to our present have been statesmanlike and, and leading us, certainly not through malice, but for the best intentions in trying to save life. But now there is no playbook that they have, so we need to help them write that playbook. And I'm seeing some key messages come through, which I'll perhaps conclude on. Perhaps we could go to Rion, to Tim and to Nigel, to conclude with what are those silver linings and how can we assist the government in ensuring that we have a smooth and accelerated return to economic activity would you like to jump in there sorry well, nigel go ahead yeah, yeah sure i mean look as i said i i, I think uh, there's a lot more um uh, multilateralism about the response to this um than uh than uh, may be apparent i think um one uh uh one potential um, uh, benefit from this crisis may be that the world um, scales up resources um, for future, not just for future pandemic planning, but also for um, uh, the search for vaccines or effective treatments and the distribution of those uh, vaccines and treatments uh, for other existing infectious diseases. Um, you know, there's still a massive challenge in Africa on uh, AIDS, TB and malaria. And, yes. and, and this, it's a type of, of channels that we need to distribute those. Um, I think the other thing I would, I would highlight, we are spending quite a lot of time thinking about how we can promote a more sustainable, greener recovery. Um, and I think uh, Western Cape is a, is a great example of um, a province which is, which is uh, committed to this agenda and doing 
things about it. Um, uh, but there are other parts of South Africa that would equally uh, benefit from um, the interest that there is going to be internationally in investing in a, a greener, more sustainable build back. So, I, you know, I think that's something for the South African uh, government to think about in, in, in its pitch for, uh, um, you know, renewed uh, investment uh, when this is when we're, when we're coming out of the crisis. Thanks very much, Nigel. That's Rian, you'd like to come in there. Sure, thank you, Leon. Uh, I'm going to look on to what uh, the High Commissioner mentioned. Um, previously, I, I, I said that, you know, we, I think a couple of concepts that we got gotten used to over many, many years are being challenged by this particular pandemic. And, and one of those things that I mentioned was multilateralism. And I mentioned that specifically and went through some of the examples as an example how you know, global value chains will change significantly as a result of, of what we've seen now. But uh, also getting back to kind of like the national kind of conversation and uh, development that we've had over the last four to five years. Uh, I think also, you know, what we've seen historically, at least, and I'm very glad that John is not here to correct me anymore, but typically what happens when we see um, major shocks on economic systems is that the nations don't tend to look at it, at it from a nationalistic point of view. If the only way you're going to trade out of this is by trading with other people and other countries. So I think that's going to be like a, you know, maybe a silver lining for multilateralism, you know, going forward out of this. And of course, I think that that silver lining will be even brighter the longer this goes on. But um, for, 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 for all of us, I hope this doesn't go on for very long. And then the other thing I think that's also uh, something that we just need to consider, um, which is not necessarily a silver lining or, or any sort, is that, yes, we, we want to inform government, but I think it's very important to, to acknowledge how we're going to do that. So it's, it's one completely different thing to say, I'm going to court and I'm forcing you to do this, versus let's work with one another as equals and do so in a, 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 a responsible manner. I think you get more out of people if you work with them on an amicable basis than anything else. And I think that's why we've, for instance, seen some pushback by government, whether that's rational or not, is not, not, not up for debate, in some sectors where, as an example, the alcohol industry and the submission that they've made, and why they're not allowed, and why their roadmap only starts really looking potentially uh, to come online from level three. Um, it's, it's, it's how you position it, it's, it's how you speak to government and also how it is that you maybe segmentize your particular industry. As an example, just going back to the alcohol industry and, and, and looking at it specifically, David asked the question, um, you know, it, surely you can segment it where, you know, if there's a concern by government, you address that concern and say, maybe we can't come online fully yet. Maybe we should also look at what all of the other manufacturers have been doing and have been allowed to do. You're not allowed to come online immediately, but maybe there's a certain percentage of onlineness that you can be on, whether that is online deliveries, as an example, or whatever it may be. So position yourself so that we can take the most out of what uh, the ministers have given us thus far and what the regulations have given us. And that's really an, an escape. That law says that we are allowed to go to government and say, if we can reduce the risk, we are able to operate, but we need to demonstrate it. Thank you. Thanks, Rian. Thank you very much. And Tim, perhaps I can, I can invite you to, to have some concluding comments and observations. Yeah, thanks, Leon. I, <clears throat> so just two last points. Um, firstly, uh, things are moving so quickly and there's so much change happening all at the same time that it, it's, it's difficult even to keep perspective based on the last six weeks of the lockdown. But actually, I was just listening to Rian now uh, and thinking about Four weeks ago, we were spending all day, every day, uh, trying to save businesses that were going down in the wine sector, in the boat building sector, in the cosmetic sector, in the film sector. They were all facing cash flow crises that they weren't able to uh, deal with while they weren't able to either export or operate. And the truth is in each of those sectors now, there have been sufficient concessions on the regulatory side that the pressure's off. I mean, it's not, it's, they're, they're, some of them are still in difficult situations, but they're, they're managing to get back to economic activity. They're managing to pay uh, their bills and they're managing to keep their employees uh, employed. So I think 
it's important. I know we're all very frustrated on the regulatory front, but uh, as Rian says, there, there have been already a lot of successes in the last few weeks uh, resolving and reforming the regulations to help save businesses. So that's what we're all focused on doing now. And I think we must take heart from the successes that we've had as industry up until now. Then in terms of sort of light at the end of the tunnel, uh, I, I, I think you know, the Western Cape is highly exposed on the on the tourism side, obviously, but there are, you know, most people don't realize that our economy is about about 70 percent business services in the Cape. So that's financial services, insurance, the tech sector. These these sectors are most able to work remotely, most able to transition their business models. And, and frankly, when it comes to tech, most able to turn a crisis into an opportunity. Um, so I, I think there's some really interesting repurposing happening in businesses that, that we're working with that, that might turn this into a growth factor, uh, the crisis into a growth factor uh, post the crisis. Uh, equally, even BPO I mentioned earlier, I think they will, they will be in a growth space after the crisis. And also uh, one of the things the supply chain issues have, have made apparent is how important it is to be able to supply food and the Western Cape is is the uh, you know our biggest export market for food is the rest of Africa, and that certainly is a market that's not that's not going anywhere. Most of this, a lot of this continent depends on the Western Cape for food. Um, I also think even in travel and tourism, as as the High Commissioner said, when tourists come back, they'll be looking for greener options. They'll be looking perhaps for more open spaces, more rural options, a lot of which we can offer in Africa and the Western Cape, in particular, and then. Even just in terms of selling new business, you know, I don't know if people realize we, we announced the Virgin flight. And as I said, we checked in with them and they're still on track. They've modified it to three times a week now. That's what they're looking at, but they will be continuing until April. So it's, it's still a service that we really look forward to welcoming uh, back with the High Commissioner. Um, but it, maybe people don't know that uh, three weeks ago we uh, welcomed TAP, the Portuguese airline, who, who's going to be launching uh, Lisbon Cape Town. So there is still business being done, including in our convention bureau where the, the lead time is about three to five years. They're selling conferences for five years time in the Cape and they're doing that now. And I guess that's just a small indication that even though we're all buried in the crisis, there is light at the end of the tunnel. We will come through this and business will be back. Thank you very much, Tim. And uh, I, I often like to conclude with a quote from Churchill that you, you've actually led me to with your comments and never waste a good crisis. I think there are so many. This is actually a far more positive session than I anticipated. I expected some robust critique and some tough messages for us to relay to government, which we must continue to do and we will do as the chamber. But what I'm hearing is some real good kind of next steps. So, you know, Tim, you suggested let's open up the economy and let's exclude businesses by exception based on the risk factor. We can feed that back to Minister Patel tomorrow through Business for South Africa, through Booster. Rian, you mentioned we need the visibility to what level three, level two looks like, as well as the anticipated timelines. And we need to work with the government to keep them on track uh, as the voice of business. Uh, uh, High Commissioner Casey, Nigel, it's so good to hear of the multilateralism that we're engaging in again. And from that multilateral perspective, really looking and celebrating the links of how important British business British bilateral trade is to South Africa and indeed the Western Cape. And of course, as the British Chamber, we want to celebrate that. And Tim, you've referred to uh, TU and Get Smarter. And I, I was working with them when they, they were acquired. Get Smarter was acquired by TU. It's such a great piece of business. And indeed, we've got Yuppie Chef joining us today. I, I know they're co-investors uh, in TU and Get Smarter and some of the other initiatives like Names and Faces that are great tech products that we're launching globally now out of the Western Cape. So there is some real good news here. And I think for me, the silver lining is seizing this opportunity to not waste this crisis and take the opportunity to shift the paradigm and look to new models of business, sustainable models of business, more responsible, sustainable capitalism. But looking at those BPO opportunities, those export opportunities, those green tourism opportunities. Uh, so I think, you know, as we're getting kind of excited around what this new normal can look like, let us stay on the front foot. Let us be optimistic, but realistic. And we will keep being your voice in terms of communicating these key messages back to government. Uh, I'd really like to thank my panelists. Uh, Nigel, you're extremely busy uh, getting the Brits back that we need to get back. Thank you so much for joining us and sharing your insights. Tim, great to have you on board with Westgrow. Let, let's do this again. And Rion, uh, this is a part of our ongoing partnership with your organization. 
thank you again for your personal insights and indeed the legal insights. EMA and Mission Control, uh, thank you for managing this. And uh, I kept my military analogies to a minimum today. David at r &B, thank you so much for helping us kind of bring this together and get the audience. And of course, my team behind the scenes, Leslie getting the invites out, and Venice, uh, the operational backbone as ever, thank you so much. Please stay connected with us, communicate with us, and we will be pushing back to the Ministry of Hotel tomorrow, relaying your concerns and comments. Stay safe, everybody, and I look forward to communicating very soon. Thank you very much. Cheers, everyone.